。立法會主席。早晨，今次會議係牛年第一次嘅立法會會議，我祝各位牛年身心康泰，萬事勝意，立法會嘅工作順利。我亦都希祝願香港早日戰勝疫情，市民係安居樂業，百業興旺。政府法案首讀：二零二一年撥款條例草案，二零二一年仲裁修訂條例草案，二零二一年僱用。補償修訂條例草案，二零二一年道路交通修訂條例草案。二讀財政司司長，主席、各位議員、各位市民，早晨。我僅動議二讀二零二一年撥款條例草案。主席，過去呢一年，大家都經歷咗不一樣嘅生活，疫情加速咗經濟衰退。口罩成為咗日常生活嘅必需品，大家留喺屋企嘅時間或者係多咗，不過同親友們大夥兒相聚嘅機會卻係少咗。呢一年成為大家嘅共同回憶。疫情讓我哋重新認識全球化不單係經濟發展嘅動力，亦都係對抗病毒同疫情嘅關鍵。冇任何一個地方可以獨善其身。合力先至能夠擊退呢一場困擾全球嘅世紀疫症。香港喺過去兩年幾經波折，國際政治張力損害咗出口同埋市場氣氛，暴力衝擊危害咗社會嘅穩定同埋安全。疫情讓整個社會同埋經濟承受多一重嘅壓力。去年本港經濟負增長百分之六點一。最新失業率升到百分之七，特區政府合共投入咗近三千億元提供支援，希望能夠發揮穩經濟舒民困嘅作用。然而呢個亦都認到財政赤字，升到歷史最高。目前疫情仍然揮之不去，經濟仲未走出衰退。當務之急係壓止疫情，全速推進疫苗接種計劃。讓市民嘅生活同埋工商百業早日回復正軌，並且盡快安全咁恢復同內地同國際間嘅相互通話。我會一如以往為抗疫工作全面配備所需嘅資源。今年嘅財政預算案重點係穩經濟舒民困，透過超過一千二百億元嘅逆週期措施，緩解經濟下行同埋疫情打擊。帶嚟嘅痛感同埋壓力，發揮資源運用嘅共幹效應，盡力讓市民、打工仔同埋企業都受惠。同樣重要嘅係找緊未來發展嘅大方向同埋新趨勢，策略性咁喺關鍵嘅環節加強政策引導、措施配合同埋資源投放，讓香港嘅產業發展更加豐富、多元同埋互動。並且增添新嘅動力。喺接落嚟嘅 diverse and interactive development, I will go into more details in the ensuing paragraphs. Economic situation in 2020. Last year, the COVID-19 epidemic ravaged the world, causing unprecedented repercussions on the global economy. The International Monetary Fund estimated that the global economy contracted significantly by 3.5 percent for the year as a whole. At the onset of the outbreak, governments around the world implemented stringent social distancing requirements and widespread lockdowns, plunging many major economies into a deep recession in the first half of last year. Amid a sharp fall in external demand caused by the epidemic, Hong Kong's total exports of goods tumbled by 9.7 percent year on. 內地疫情受控，經濟強勁反彈，其他主要經濟體亦都喺下半年逐步復甦。香港整體貨物出口喺下半年重拾增長，但係全年仍係微跌百分之零點三。喺疫情嘅威脅之下，全球各地廣泛實施旅遊限制，訪港旅遊業去年絕大部分時間處喺冰封狀態，旅遊服務輸出全年大跌百分之九十點五。
，期內金融服務輸出則輕温和增長，但係整體服務輸出全年計仍係錄得百分之三十點八嘅紀錄跌幅。本地疫情反覆，社交距離措施不時收緊，加上就業同埋收入狀況疲弱，打擊本地嘅消費意欲。儘管私人消費開支跌幅喺去年下半年有所收窄，但係全年仍係顯著下跌百分之十點一，營商前景高度不明朗，投資開支下跌百分之十一點五。香港整體經濟去年上半年大幅收縮百分之九，第三季稍見改善，但係第四季後期到現在再受疫情嘅打擊，去年全年合計。經濟收縮百分之六點一，係有記錄以嚟最大嘅年度跌幅，亦都係香港首次連續兩年負增長。勞工市場急劇惡化，經季節性調整後嘅失業率由前年第四季嘅百分之三點三升到最新嘅百分之七，係接近十七年嘅高位。疫情籠罩之下，同消費同埋旅遊相關行業深受打擊，零售住宿同埋膳食服務。合計嘅失業率上升百分之十一點三，當中餐飲服務業嘅失業率更係高達百分之十四點七，建造業嘅失業率亦都達到雙位數字水平。年內住户收入跌幅顯著，由於經濟疲弱，消費物價通脹壓力輕微，撇除政府一次性措施嘅影響，舊年全年基本通脹率係百分之一點三，比較前年。低一點七個百分點。樓市方面，舊年住宅物業市場總體嚟講大致平穩，商業同埋工業樓宇價格比前年高位顯著下跌，交投量亦都跌到紀錄嘅新低。隨住香港金融管理局放寬非住宅物業按揭貸款嘅宏觀審慎措施，以及政府撤銷非住宅物業交易嘅雙倍重價印花税，舊年後期。交投稍為回升。二零二一年經濟前瞻同埋中期展望，隨住世界多個地方已經相繼展開疫苗接種計劃，全球經濟有望喺下半年起出現比較明顯嘅改善。國際貨幣基金組織上月預測，今年全球經濟將會反彈百分之五點五。內地經濟去年初受疫情嚴重衝擊。但係疫情迅迅速受控，加上適時有力嘅宏觀政策，經濟第二季強勁復甦，全年增長百分之二點三，成為全球唯一實現正增長嘅主要經濟體。展望今年，雖然全球疫情同埋中美關係嘅發展仍有變數，但係內地經濟基調良好。舊年底中央經濟工作會議強調。今年宏觀政策會保持連續性、穩定性同埋可持續性，以保持對經濟恢復嘅必要支持，將有利內地經濟強勁增長。美國經濟喺去年第三季開始改善，隨住疫苗接種展開，加上財政刺激措施同埋寬鬆嘅貨幣環境嘅支持，市場普遍預測今年美國經濟將會有較快嘅增長。歐洲嘅經濟最近因疫情反彈再度放緩，不過歐洲央行自去年底加強政策支持，只要疫苗被廣泛應用，歐元區嘅經濟預料會喺今年散啦，稍後反彈。若果疫情受控，日本同埋亞洲其他經濟體今年亦都會有明顯嘅復甦。各位議員。美國政府嘅外交同埋經濟政策走向受全球關注，對中美關係同埋經貿嘅影響尤為重要。各界都盼望雙方嘅經貿關係逐漸回復正常，以支持全球貿易同埋商務活動進一步恢復。然而，從過去幾年嘅發展可見，兩國之間仍然存在唔少深層次矛盾，往後仍會係維持張力持續。鬥而不破嘅格局，佢嘅變化會影響全球貿易、金融同埋政治局勢。其他地緣政局同埋全球公共債務急升，亦都可能會引發金融風險等。呢啲外雲變數都係需要關注嘅。
。香港經濟預料今年恢復正增長，但係復甦嘅進程將視乎疫情嘅發展、跨境人流同埋旅遊活動復原需時。經濟喺上半年仍會面對較大嘅挑戰，不過只要齊心協力控制疫情。社會環境維持穩定，加上預期全球經濟反彈、經濟復甦嘅動力，喺下半年可望顯著加強。考慮到內外最新嘅形勢以及財政措施嘅提振作用，我預測今年經濟實質增長介乎百分之三點五至五點五。通脹方面，外圍價格壓力維持溫和，本地嘅經濟喺連續兩年收縮之後。今年整體經濟活動仍將低於衰退前嘅水平，唔會對本定成本構成明顯嘅壓力。我預測今年整體通脹率同埋基本通脹率分別係百分之一點六同埋百分之一。中期而言，香港繼續受惠於內地嘅持續發展同埋全球經濟重心西向東移呢一個大。Finland and the shift in global economic gravity from west to east. The economic outlook is positive. Our country's economy will continue to advance during the 14th five-year period, five-year plan period. The signing of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership or RCEP agreement will further promote economic integration in the region. Hong Kong can open up greater room for development by leveraging the advantages under one country, two systems, playing its unique role as a gateway. And an intermediary integrating into the new overall development of our country, actively participating in the national dual circulation development strategy, and seizing opportunities brought by the development of the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area, and the Belt and Road Initiative. On the other hand, the government will strive to overcome land and talent constraints, promote innovation and technology development, invest in education and nurture talent, and strengthen connection with the world. Considering the above factors and taking into account the catching up growth. The catch-up growth that will follow the initial economic recovery this year, I forecast that Hong Kong's economy will grow by an average of 3.3 percent per annum in real terms, from 2022 to 25, while the underlying inflation rate will average 2 percent. Riding out the storm, fighting the virus together. It is the government's top priority to contain the epidemic so that businesses and the public can be back to their daily routines. A high-level steering committee, come command center led by the chief executive, was set up in January 2020 to formulate strategies and measures swiftly in response to the development of the epidemic, with a view to achieving the target of zero infections. I would like to expand, extend my heartfelt thanks to those joining the fight against the epidemic, including healthcare staff, as well as businesses and individuals who have been supporting the government's anti-epidemic measures. I will continue to provide adequate resources to fully support the work. The government strives to step up surveillance and testing efforts in order to identify cases in the community as early as possible to help cut the transmission chains. Various means are provided to collect specimens up to about 100,000 for testing each day. At present, the actual testing capacity of public and private laboratories in Hong Kong has reached a level of over 100,000 tests per day. The government has allocated 4.7 billion from the anti-epidemic fund. To support the anti-epidemic work of the hospital authority, ensuring sufficient support and protection for frontline healthcare staff, the government also provides an additional allocation of 3.044 billion dollars, mainly for the HA to establish and operate the community treatment facility at the Asia World Expo and the Hong Kong Infection Control Center at the North Lantau Hospital. The former has commenced services in phases since last August, and the latter from the end of this month. The government has earmarked over 8.4 billion for the procurement and administration of COVID-19 vaccines. Our target is to have the majority of the population vaccinated for free within 2021. The COVID-19 vaccination program started yesterday and will provide vaccination for five priority groups of citizens. The government will seek funding support from the Finance Committee of the LegCo in the, at the end of this month to establish a vaccination indemnity fund with. Epidemic. The AEF is set up to enhance Hong Kong's ability in combating the epidemic and provide relief for industries and the public hit hard by the epidemic. Involve a total of over three hundred billion dollars, provided.
To support enterprises, I will implement the following measures involving a total of about 9.5 billion. A. Reducing profits tax for the year of assessment 2020 to 21 by 100%, subject to a ceiling of $10,000. The reduction will be reflected in the final, ta final tax payable for the year of assessment 2020 to 21. This will benefit 128,000 businesses and reduce government revenue by $1.05 billion. B. Providing rates concession for non domestic properties for four quarters of 2021 to 22, subject to a ceiling of $5,000 per quarter in the first two quarters and a ceiling of $2,000 per quarter in the remaining two quarters for each rateable property. This proposal is estimated to involve 420,000 non domestic properties and reduce government revenue by $3.4 billion. C. Waiving the business registration fees for 2021 to 22. This will benefit 1.5 million business operators and reduce government revenue by 3 billion. D. Continuing to waive 75% of water and sewage charges payable by non domestic households for eight months starting from April 2021, subject to a monthly ceiling of $20,000 and $12,500 respectively per household. This will benefit 250,000 non domestic households and reduce government revenue by $680 million. And E, continuing to grant the 75% rental or fee concession currently applicable to eligible tenants of government properties and eligible short-term tenancies and waivers under the Lands Department for six months starting from April. During the period, tenants who have to close their properties at the request of the government will continue to receive full rental waiver for the duration of the closure. This will reduce government revenue by $1.4 billion. The government has introduced a number of enhancements to the SME financing guarantee scheme, including the rollout of the 90% guarantee product and the one-year special 100% guarantee product to provide enterprises with low interest loans or interest subsidies, as well as principal moratorium, during which only interest payments have to be made, giving them more breathing space for recovery. As at the end of January, a total of $42.7 billion in loans was approved under the 100% guarantee product, benefiting over 20,000 enterprises involving 260,000 employees. As the epidemic has been lingering for over a year, in order to continue to relieve the cash flow pressure of SMEs, I will extend the application period of the special 100% guarantee product to the end of this year, further increase the maximum loan amount per enterprise from the total amount of employee wages and rents for 12 months to that for 18 months and raise the loan ceiling from 5 million to 6 million, extend the maximum repayment period from five years to eight years, and extend the maximum duration of principal moratorium from 12 to, eight, to 18 months. The Hong Kong Mortgage Corporation Insurance Limited will announce the details later. Further to the launch of the pre-approved principal payment holiday scheme, together with the banking sector in response to the epidemic last May, the HAMA announced in November that this scheme would be extended for six months to April 2021, having regard to the ongoing impact of the epidemic on economic activities. Some 120,000 eligible corporate customers are covered by the scheme. Under the scheme and other relief initiatives offered by banks, about 59,000 cases have been approved by banks to support enterprises as at end January, involving about $70-$50 billion. Support employment. Following the allocation of funding to enhance the love upgrading special scheme run by the employees retraining board in last year's budget, the ELB launched the third tranche of the scheme in January to provide training and allowance for 20,000 trainees affected by the economic situation. The government will ask the ELB to launch the fourth tranche of the scheme in July, which will last for six months until the end of this year, benefiting 20,000 trainees. The ELB will continue to provide more training options under the scheme and more online courses for trainees to engage in distance learning during the epidemic. Having regard to the advancement in technology and changes in learning mode, the government plans to expand the scope of the Continuing Education Fund to include online courses to provide learners with more diversified ways of continuing learning. Meanwhile, we will ensure effective supervision over the quality of courses and teaching. The government will consult the sector to implement the measure upon commencement of the new school term in September. In 2020 to 21, the government created about 31,000 time limited jobs in the public and private sectors through the AEF. As at end January, some 16,000 employments were made. 
I propose to further allocate six point six billion to create about thirty thousand time limited jobs for a period of twelve months. I also I will also introduce the following one off measures to alleviate the impacts of the economic downturn on the public. A reducing salaries, tax and tax under personal assessment for the year of assessment twenty twenty to twenty one by one hundred percent, subject to a ceiling of ten thousand dollars. The reduction will be reflected in the final tax payable for the year of assessment twenty twenty and twenty one. This will benefit one point eight seven million taxpayers and reduce government revenue by eleven point four billion. B providing rates concession for domestic properties for four quarters of twenty twenty to twenty one, twenty one to twenty two, subject to a ceiling of one point five thousand per quarter in the first two quarters and a ceiling of one thousand per quarter in the remaining two quarters for each rateable property. This proposal is estimated to involve two point nine five million domestic properties and reduce government revenue by eleven point nine Point six billion. C granting each residential electricity account a subsidy of one thousand dollars. This measure will involve an expansion of two point eight billion and benefit over two point seven million eligible households. D providing an allowance to eligible social security recipients equal to one half of a month of the standard rate CSSA payment, old age allowance, old age living allowance or disability allowance. This will involve additional expansion of two point three eight two billion dollars. Similar arrangements will apply to recipients of the Working Family Allowance and indi individual based work incentive transport subsidy involving additional expansion of one hundred and twenty one million. And E paying the examination fees for school can candidates sitting for the twenty twenty two Hong Kong Diploma of Secondary Education Examination incurring one hundred and fifty million dollars. This prolonged economic downturn has plunged some people into financial difficulties. In view of this, many people have demanded temporary unemployment assistance. The government has reiterated the policy considerations it has taken into account for not accepting the proposal and instead provided a time limited special scheme under the CSSA scheme to help the unemployed. Considering that many grassroots have been suffering from underemployment amid the epidemic, the government proposes to relax the working hour requirements under the Working Family Allowance Scheme. Among them, the current basic working our requirement of not fewer than 144 hours per month for non-single parent households will be substantially lowered by half for one year. The measure will be implemented in June at the earliest subject to FC approval. To provide an extra financing option for the unemployed, I suggest setting up a special 100% loan guarantee for individual scheme as a supplementary measure. The government will offer a guarantee for loans provided under the scheme. The maximum loan amount per applicant is set at six times of his or her Average monthly income during employment, subject to a ceiling of eighty thousand dollars. There will be a principal moratorium for the first twelve months. Afterwards, the principal and interest can be repaid over a period of up to five years with an interest rate fixed at one percent per annum. Applicants who have repaid loans in full as scheduled will be offered full reimbursement for the interest paid. Freelancers who provide proof of loss of income may also apply for the loan. The government will provide a total guarantee commitment of $15 billion. The application period will last for six months. The Financial Services and the Treasury Bureau will, in collaboration with the HKMCIL, announce the details in due course. Amid the epidemic, the public are increasingly concerned about environmental hygiene issues such as mixed connection and the lepidation of the drainage pipes of buildings. I will earmark $1 billion to provide subsidies for owners of more than 3,000 old buildings with relatively low rateable values to carry out drainage repair or enhance enhancement works. For buildings with owners having difficulties in organizing the works by themselves, such as three new buildings, the buildings department will exercise its power under the building's ordinance to carry out the works in default of their owners in an orderly manner based on the risk profile. The owners concerned may also benefit from the subsidy scheme, reviving the economy after the epidemic, while having a profound effect on the global economic development and structure, as well as people's lifestyle. To enable our economy to revive after the epidemic, we would adopt a tighter approach. Apart from helping enterprises adapt to the economic new normal after the epidemic and stimulating consumption, we should also promote our advantages outside Hong Kong. I will elaborate on the relevant measures in the ensuing parts of our speech.
Digital economy. Many traditional industries have accelerated the application of technology in their operations due to the epidemic. Examples include digital payments, smart self service systems, and various online businesses, customer services, and workflow management. For many people, who stay at home during the epidemic, the use of online shopping services, video streaming platforms, and online conference software has become the new mode of working, studying, and entertainment. For various trades, it has now become a trend to speed up digital transformation in order to adapt to the new consumption modes and habits of the people. Only by making good use of information technology can enterprises seize the opportunities of development when the epidemic is over. In view of the above, we have launched the Distance Business Program under the AEF to provide funding support for enterprises to adopt information technology solutions and cover the expenses for providing relevant training to their employees. The program has received an overwhelming response since its launch in mid-2020, and a total funding of nearly $800 million has been granted. We have subsequently allocated an additional funding of $1 billion for the continuation of the program and further enhancements. The challenges posed by the epidemic have also catalyzed local IMT developments. They not only incentivize businesses to conduct research and developments for products or innovative <coughs> services, but also provide enterprises with suitable contacts for application. The electronic wristbands used for home confinement and the touchless lift button system are some good examples. The government will continue to support enterprises of manufacturers through, among others, the public sector trial scheme, the technology voucher program, and the reindustrialization funding scheme in realizing and commercializing the R&D outcomes using technological services to improve their productivity or business process and setting up smart production lines in Hong Kong. This will enable them to better grasp the opportunities brought by the new economy. I will allocate a total of $375 million to the Hong Kong Trade Development Council, TDC, in the three years starting from 2020 to 21, 21 to 22 for develop, developing virtual platforms to enhance its capability to organize online activities and to proceed with digitalization. Moreover, the TDC will promote Hong Kong's strength in the development of the GBA and in healthcare products and services. It will also explore the use of its physical and online business to consumer platforms to assist young business starters in promoting their original products and gauging the preference of consumers. In light of the epidemic, we have expedited our work in taking forward e-government by providing more electronic services to make it easier for enterprises and individuals to submit applications, make payments, obtain licenses, and use government services. By mid-2022, unless there are legal or operational constraints, all government forms and license applications can be submitted electronically. Besides, e-payment options, including the faster payment system, will be available for making payments in respect of most government bills and licenses starting from mid-2022. The Iron Smart, a one-stop personalized digital service platform, was launched at the end of last year. The HAMA is currently working with the Office of the Government's Chief Information Officer, that is OGCIO, to develop the business version of the Iron Smart digital authentication platform. It can be used to authenticate the identity of enterprises through an electronic channel. With the wide adoption of IM Smart in various electronic government services, members of the public can choose to obtain their data kept by individual government departments by electronic means and submit such data electronically when applying for services from financial institutions. In addition, the HAMA has earlier announced the development of commercial data interchange, which will allow commercial services operators to submit customers' data to financial institutions under the instruction and consent of their corporate customers so as to assist them in the application for services. To promote the law tech developments, I set aside funding in the 2019-20 to budget to support the development of an online dispute resolution and deal-making platform by a non-governmental organization, NGO. With an allocation of $100 million to the project starting from this year, the platform will roll out negotiation, arbitration, mediation, and online training services progressively and develop other services such as e-translation and smart contract interfaces. This year, the government will actively explore the developments of the Hong Kong legal cloud in order to sharpen Hong Kong's edge and raise our status, status in the provision of professional legal services. In view of the current special situation, the government should make good use of the fiscal reserves to energize the market, stimulate the economy, and facilitate the speedy recovery of the consumption market and other economic segments in a timely manner. After careful consideration, I will issue electronic consumption vouchers in installments with a total value of $5,000 to each eligible Hong Kong permanent resident and new arrival aged 18 or above so as to encourage and boost local consumption. 
This measure, which involves a financial commitment of about $36 billion, is expected to benefit around 7.2 million people. The government will identify suitable stored value facilities operators to help roll out the scheme and will announce the details of the scheme as soon as possible. Explore markets. I will inject $1.5 billion into the dedicated fund on branding, upgrading and domestic sales and substantially extend in phases its geographical coverage from 20 to 37 economies to include all those with which Hong Kong has entered into investment pro promotion and protection agreements, IPPAs. The funding ceiling for each enterprise will be increased from $4 million to $6 million so as to support enterprises in exploring more diversified markets by fully utilizing the better protection offered by the IPPAs. Support tourism. The epidemic has dealt a heavy blow to the local tourism industry, bringing it to a standstill. Apart from the financial support of nearly $2.6 billion that has already been provided for the tourism industry, I will further earmark a total of $934 million to enhance tourism resources, of which $169 million will be used to continue to take forward local cultural, heritage and creative tourism projects, such as the Yin Tin Chai Arts Festival and the City in Time. We will continue to improve the facilities along hiking trails to develop more green tourism resources. The purpose is to offer leisure and travel experience with rich historical and cultural elements to both locals and visitors. I will also earmark $765 million to support the Hong Kong Tourism Board, HKTB, in reviving our tourism industry. The HKTB has launched promotional programs such as Holiday at Home and 360 Hong Kong Moments. We have reviewed enhancing local ambience and consumption as well as maintain maintaining the promotion and exposure of Hong Kong in visitor source markets. Upon gradual resumption of cross-boundary travel, the Hong Kong TB will roll out promotional offers to attract visitors through the Open House Hong Kong platform. The HKTB is also conducting a comprehensive review of the positioning of Hong Kong's tourism in the long run in response to the new normal after the epidemic with a view to formulating appropriate strategies to spur the recovery of the tourism industry. Provided that public health can be safeguarded, the government will consider relaxing restrictions on group gatherings in relation to local group tours again to allow room for business operation for the tourism industry. The government will discuss and work out arrangements regarding air travel bubble with places that have close economic and trade relations with Hong Kong and where the epidemic situation is relatively stable. Apart from the above initiatives, additional resources will also be allocated to enhance country parks, recreational facilities, harbour fronts, etc. These enhancements will improve people's quality of life when the epidemic is over and may also appeal to our visitors. I will pro provide more details in the ensuing parts of my speech. Promote Hong Kong. Once the pandemic further subsides, the government will launch a large-scale publicity and promotional campaign at home and abroad, showcasing to the world the image of Hong Kong as a highly open international city in the GBA from various perspectives such as finance, INT, culture and creativity and tourism, as well as our unique advantages under one country, two systems. We hope to attract enterprises, investors and talents to Hong Kong. Invest Hong Kong and our overseas offices will step up their efforts in this area. Positioning and directions for economic development. First, assessment of situation. Hong Kong has been leveraging the support from the mainland while engaging the world. Over the past many years, we have been utilizing our advantages in institution, talents and external connections and served as a bridge between our country and the rest of the world in different ways in response to our country's ever-changing needs. By doing so, Hong Kong has contributed to national developments and at the same time promoted its own developments and economic growth. Only by making good use of the advantages of one country to systems with the precondition of strengthening national security can we continue to play and even enhance our role on this difference. Over the past two years, Hong Kong has been affected by the deterioration of the China-U.S. relations and experienced the blow from the social, social incidents and the ravages of the pandemic. However, we should not let these challenges weaken our confidence in the future. Instead, we should learn from the experience and make correct assessments of the major development trends. First, the world is facing profound changes and the scene in its century. The economic 
properties shifting from west to east, and the political setting has also seen subtle changes. A country's composite national strength has enhanced significantly, while other developing countries in Asia have undergone robust development. However, with the rise of unilateralism in re recent years and the misunderstandings of some Western countries towards Hong Kong's developments, we are facing greater difficulties. The epidemic has increased various countries' concerns about development security, which might further escalate protectionism. Some nations encourage or even ask enterprises to move back to their home countries, impacting on the development and setting of global value chains. Second, the world is facing drastic disruptions brought by technological revolution, which have far-reaching implications for our present life, modes of production and operation, economic structures, development prospects, and international landscape. The pandemic has also accelerated changes in the mode of business operation and people's living habits. Making good use of digital technology is not only essential to effective business operation, but also crucial for preventing and combating the pandemic and protecting public health and safety. Whether a place can attain a leading position in INT will determine the success or failure. Third, green development is a major global trend. Environmental pollution and climate change have come, become too serious to ignore. There is a general recognition in the international community that we should promote green and low-carbon development, which involves extensive new areas. The government needs to have visions and determination. The people need to build awareness of the environmental protection and corresponding habits. The business sector needs to develop and adopt novel technologies and launch products of high efficiency. Other matching services such as financial support are also needed. Fourth, as for Hong Kong, we have experienced many changes at different points in our history, but the support of our country has remained unchanged. With the advantages under one country, two systems, Hong Kong has a unique and irreplaceable role in the national development. Functions and positioning. With its deep and extensive connections with the world, Hong Kong will continue to be an important platform for economic change exchanges and trade between the mainland and the international community. As mentioned in the proposal for formulating the national 14th five-year plan, our country supports Hong Kong in consolidating and bolstering our competitive edges, building the city as an international IND hub, fostering the development of the city as a BNR functional platform, and achieving diversified and sustainable developments of the economy. With our country support, we can further capitalize on our advantages and realize our potential. We must step up our efforts to explore international economic and trade opportunities and actively participate in national development through making use of our industries with competitive strengths. Hong Kong has prominent functional roles in various aspects, such as pooling international capital and talent and providing a platform to align the country's standards with the international ones. In addition, Hong Kong serves as a testing ground and firewall in our country's promotion of financial sector reform and opening up, such as the internationalization of RMB. Under our country's due circulation development strategy, Hong Kong will definitely achieve greater success in the future as long as we can give full play to our unique roles as a gateway, a springboard, and an intermediary. Leveraging our close proximity, Hong Kong can make use of the GBA development as an entry point, participating actively in the development of our country's domestic circulation for capturing the enormous business opportunities. As an international metropolis that connects the world, Hong Kong can help the expansion of the country's external circulation and, in consequence, further strengthen its status as an international center for finance, commerce, commerce and trade, as well as a home for corporate headquarters. In face of rising unilateralism, it is all the more important for us to actively promote multilateralism, dismantle various barriers, and strengthen Hong Kong's links with the international community. We should further expand Hong Kong's trade investment and tax agreement networks. The free trade agreement and the investment agreements between Hong Kong and the ASEAN nations have recently come into full effect. In November last year, our country signed the RCEP agreement with 14 economies. We are actively seeking to be among the first batch of economies joining the RCEP after it comes to effect so as to help us help our businesses and investors open up markets, thereby fostering the long-term economic development of Hong Kong. The way forward for industries. From the perspective of industries, Hong Kong has huge development potential in areas including financial services, INT, green economy, air cargo, supply chain management, and professional services. Financial services are an important support to the real economy. On top of being a leading asset and wealth management center, Hong Kong is also an international fundraising platform, an insurance and risk management center, and an offshore RMB hub. Our financial services can assist mainland enterprises in raising funds and provide outlets and risk management for mainland funds, as well as facilitating the mainland's ongoing financial liberalization in a secure 
review and orderly manner in support of the development of our country's real economy. We must continue to strengthen Hong Kong's leading position in the global financial market. Hong Kong enjoys a number of advantages in IT development, such as top-notch capabilities in basic scientific research, intellectual property rights protection, attractiveness to research talents from all over the world, and first-class financial support services. In recent years, the government has allocated substantial resources and implemented a number of preferential policies and been blessed with the country's support. As long as we can leverage our advantages and achieve coordinated development with our brother cities that have advanced manufacturing industries in the GBA, we can form the INT upstream, midstream and downstream industrial chain and develop the GBA into an international INT center, thus contributing to our country's technological self-reliance and at the same time identifying new areas of growth for Hong Kong's economy. Nowadays, when everyone is striving to live a quality life, decarbonization, waste reduction, building of a green environment and a sustainable city, etc., have become a social consensus. The international community, including our country and the European Union, have set achieving carbon neutrality as an important development goal. A significant synergy effect can be generated between green economy and other industries such as the INT and financial sectors. A robust green and sustainable financial services can contribute to the development of green economy in the mainland and Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a world-class logistics and supply chain management center with a well-established network of air routes, a highly efficient airports, as well as simple and fast customs clearance procedures. Hong Kong's air cargo transport sector plays a leading role in the world. We will strive to enhance our intermodal transportation services in the future with a view to increasing the global accessibility of the GBA. This will facilitate not only the exports of goods from the GBA to overseas markets, but also the imports of quality products from around the world to the mainland, meeting the increasing consumer demands here. Technology is reshaping the interplay between the supply of goods and the demand of consumers, and the prospects for our high-end logistics and supply chain management services are bright. As our country seeks to achieve high-quality developments, the demand for various types of professional services such as legal, accounting, construction and project management services is on the rise. These areas are where our strength lies. Hong Kong's professionals can provide services in a market full of opportunities and also promote the alignment of industry standards in the mainland with those of the international community. Apart from the above industries, there is also a growing demand for inclusion of cultural and creative elements in the cyber world. I will allocate additional resources to promote the development of cultural and creative industries so that young people can have more employment and business startup opportunities for unleashing the potential and realizing their dreams. GBA. As mentioned earlier, the GBA is the best entry point for Hong Kong to participate in the domestic circulation of a country's economy, be it for the mutual market access for financial services and products, cooperation and collaboration in respect of innovation and technology, or people's stay and living across the boundary. Continued innovation in institutional and policy arrangements is needed so as to ensure a smoother two-way flow of funds, people and factors of production. The Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area Development Office has been set up to strengthen the planning, coordination and promotion of the various policies and measures relating to GBA development and enhance the community's understanding of GBA development. The government also helps Hong Kong's business, businesses and youths to grasp the opportunities arising from GBA development through various schemes. Belt and Road. Our country has signed cooperation agreements with about 170 countries and international organizations regarding the BNR initiative. The government will continue to provide financing services to BNR infrastructure projects through leveraging Hong Kong's function as an international financial center, encouraging Hong Kong enterprises and professional services sectors to develop business in the overseas economic and trade cooperation zones set up by our country and establish connections with mainland enterprises and industry associations for jointly exploring new markets, thereby consolidating our role as a prime functional platform and key note for the BNR initiative. Financial services. Comprehensive and superb financial services are crucial for an economy gearing for high quality development. The value added for the of the financial services industry in Hong Kong accounted for 21% of the GDP in 2019. Its share of the overall employment increased from 6.8% in 2018 to 7.1% in 2019. Hong Kong has always been an offshore financing center for mainland enterprises and an important conduit for international capital to enter the mainland market. The capital markets of Hong Kong and the mainland can complement and interact positively with each other. Last year's total transaction value of the southbound and northbound trading of stock connect programs 
more than doubled than that of the year before. The mutual market access programs have been operating smoothly. Hong Kong can contribute more proactively to our country's dual circulation strategy. The FSTB, together with the HAMA, the Securities and Futures Commis Commission, SFC, and the Insur Insurance Authority, IA, has set up a joint working group to explore how Hong Kong can complement the economic and financial developments of our country and meet the needs of international investors and examine how to further enhance our competitiveness as an international financial center on the basis of our existing capacities. It will set out the development's blueprints and put forward concrete proposals and measures for engagement with the central authorities to secure their support. Green and sustainable finance. Having regard to the goal of achieving carbon neutrality before 2050, we will continue to promote the development of green and sustainable finance, encouraging institutions to conduct relevant investments, financing and certification activities, and attract top-notch institutions and talents to Hong Kong to provide the relevant services. We will join hands with the financial sector and relevant stakeholders to take forward the strategic plan announced at the end of last year by the Green and Sustainable Finance Cross-Agency Steering Group, thereby leveraging our role as an international financial center to mobilize capital, capital towards sustainable projects in the region and enhance Hong Kong's position as a green and sustainable finance hub in the region. Last month, we successfully offered the second batch of government's green bonds totaling 2.5 billion US dollars, among which the 30-year tranche is the longest tan tenor bond issued by the government and the longest tenor USD denominated government bond in Asia to date. We plan to issue green bonds regularly and expand the scale of the government's green bond program. We propose to double the borrowing ceiling of the program to $200 billion to allow for further issuance of green bonds to totaling $175.5 billion within the next five years, having regard to the market situation. This will also give us more room for piloting the issuance of green bonds that involves more types of currencies, project types, and issuance channels, thereby further enriching the green finance ecosystem in Hong Kong. We also plan to issue retail green bonds for the participation of the general public. The pilot bond grant scheme and the green bond grant scheme rolled out by the government previously will expire by mid-2021. I will consolidate the two schemes into a green and sustainable finance grant scheme to provide subsidy for eligible bond issuers and loan borrowers to cover their expenses on bond issuance and external review services. The scheme will last for three years, and the HAMA will announce relevance details in due course. Bond market. Through the active proportion of the government, Hong Kong's bond market has been sustained, has seen sustained growth, now ranking third in Asia, excluding Japan in terms of total amount of bond issuances. I will lead a steering group comprising members from the FSCB, the HMA, the SFC, the IA, and the Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing Limited to formulate a roadmap for promoting the diversified development of Hong Kong's bond market and reinforcing its functions. We will enhance the efficiency and capacity of our domestic central money makers unit, or CMU, and introduce new functions to cope with the increasing market demand for northbound trading of Bond Connect and support its future commissioning of southbound trading with a view to providing a risk control channel for mainland investors to participate in local and overseas bond markets. We will develop the CMU as a major central securities depository platform in Asia and in the world in the long run. Bond Connect Development we target to expand Bond Connect to cover both southbound and northbound trading. The implementation of southbound trading will further facilitate mainland investors to make diversified asset allocation and present enormous opportunities for Hong Kong's financial industry. The HAMA and People's Bank of China have set up a working group to drive the initiative of southbound trading of Bond Connect with the target of launching it within the year. Retail Bond Market Given that the global low interest rate environment will persist for a considerably long time and many people in the community, especially the elderly, prefer investment options with steady and reliable returns, we plan to continue to issue no less than $24 billion of silver bond and no less than $15 billion of I bond this year. We propose to raise the borrowing limit of the government bond program from $200 billion to $300 billion to allow sufficient room for bond issuances to achieve the objective of promoting the sustainable development of Hong Kong's bond market. The eligible age for subscribing silver bond will be lowered from 65 to 60. 
we are committed to developing the real estate investment trust market in Hong Kong and reinforcing the city's role as a premier capital raising center while offering investors a wide range of investment options with relatively stable returns. Subsidies will be provided for qualifying REITs authorized by the SFC and listed in Hong Kong in the coming three years to encourage the listing of more REITs in Hong Kong. The subsidy will cover 70% of the expenses paid to local professional service providers for the listing of REITs subject to a cap of $8 million per REIT. The SFC will announce relevant details in due course. Securities market. Undaunted by challenges from external factors, the Hong Kong stock market recorded an average daily turnover of $129.5 billion last year, representing a rise of 49% over the year before. A total of $397.5 billion was raised through initial public offerings during the same period, representing an increase of 27% over the year before, and among which over 90% of the funds were raised by mainland enterprises. Not only is Hong Kong a preferred international fundraising platform, it is also the world's second largest fundraising hub for biotechnology companies. There have been 43 companies listed under the new listing regime in Hong Kong since its introduction, raising a total of over $420 billion, which accounts for about 40% of total IPO funds raised in the period. These companies have a combined market cap of over $11 trillion, accounting for about one quarter of the current total market cap in Hong Kong. They include 10 China concept stock companies, returning to Hong Kong for century listing and 31 pre-revenue or pre-profit biotech companies. Our earlier efforts in enhancing the listing regime are gradually delivering results. The Hong Kong EX will, will review the overall century listing regime, including whether greater China companies with non-weighted voting rights structures have to be companies in the field of INT in order to seek century listing in Hong Kong through the new concessionary route, as well as their corresponding market capitalization requirements. The Hong Kong EX will consult the market in due course. Stock Connect expands the depth and breadth of the capital market in Hong Kong and is in line with our country's financial development strategy. We will seek to expand its capacity continuously, including the progressive inclusion of ETF and other types of assets, as well as expansion of the scope of eligible securities. With international investors' increased participation in the Asia, Asia market through Stock Connect, there's a growing demand for using Asia index futures to hedge market risks. The Hong Kong EX will accelerate the preparatory work for the launch of MSCI China A index futures contract. We are currently undertaking a series of legislative work to provide for half rate profits tax concessions to eligible insurance businesses, including marine insurance and specialty insurance, facilitate the issuance of insurance linked securities or ILS in Hong Kong, expand the scope of insurable risks of captive insurance companies and enhance the group-wide supervision framework by the end of next month. We are also preparing for the implementation of a risk-based capital regime for the insurance industry to replace the rule-based capital adequacy regime. I propose launching a two-year pilot insurance-linked securities grant scheme to attract insurance enterprises or organizations to issue ILS in Hong Kong. The amount of grant for is issuance will be capped at $12 million depending on the maturity of the ILS. The IA will announce details in due course. Asset and Wealth Management Since the establishment of the two new fund structures, namely the open-ended fund company and the limited partnership fund, the investment fund regime of Hong Kong has become more comprehensive. With 11 OFCs and over 100 LPFs already set up, Hong Kong's status as an international Asset and Wealth Management Center has been consolidated. We plan to submit a legislative proposal in the second quarter of this year to allow foreign investment funds to re to Hong Kong for registration as OFCs or LPFs. OFC suits various types of investment funds. We will provide subsidies to cover 70% of the expenses paid to local professional service providers for SFC set up or re to Hong Kong in the coming three years, subject to a cap of $1 million per OFC. The SFC will announce relevant details in due course. We have introduced an amendment bill to provide tax concessions for carried interest issued by private equity funds operating in Hong Kong. We strive to secure the LegCo's passage of the bill within the current session for the tax concession arrangements 
to apply starting from 2020 to 21 to enhance our attractiveness as a hub for family offices invest hong kong and regulators will offer one-stop support services to family offices interested in establishing a presence in hong kong we will also review the relevant tax arrangements innovation and technology in the past three years the government allocated over 100 billion to support the development of int we already have eight unicorns making hong kong comparable to many larger economies despite the huge challenges imposed by the epidemic as well as the internal and external environments i'm convinced that the promotion of int is the right direction for the long-term development of hong kong in recent years the number of research personnel and the number of staff members of startups in hong kong have increased substantially to nurture int talent the education bureau has implemented a total of a number of measures to promote stem education including curriculum updating providing professional training for teachers subsidizing and organizing large-scale learning activities such as the stem education fair the standing committee on stem education of the curriculum development council steers and promotes the long-term development of stem education in primary and secondary schools as well as reviews continuously the relevant curriculum the it innovation lab in secondary schools program has received positive response since its launch i will set aside over 200 million to extend the program to send to primary schools funding of up to 400,000 will be provided to each subsidized primary school in the coming three school years thereby rolling out a knowing more about it program to enhance students interest and knowledge in it and their applications through extracurricular activities to prepare them for integration into the knowledge-based economy and participation in the development of a digital society the ogo will set up a one-stop support center to provide assistance to primary schools last year i earmarked 40 million to implement a pilot scheme under which subsidies are provided for students who study science and technology in local universities to enroll in short-term int re related internships more than 1600 students and over 1000 enterprises participated in the scheme and 80 percent of the interns indicated that they would consider pursuing a career in int after graduation given the overwhelming response i announced that the scheme will be regularized the government will launch a global stem professorship scheme in the first half of the year to support universities in attracting world-renowned int scholars and their team to hong kong to participate in stem teaching and research the scheme will involve an expansion of about two billion which will be borne by the government the universities and the hong kong Choc jockey club charities trust job opportunities and continuous training are also crucial for nurturing int talent in the past three years the research talent hub has funded over 3700 r d positions among those engaged about 1400 are postdoctoral talent the reindustrialization and technology training program provided on the job training for over 3500 employees of some 1800 enterprises to enable them to have a better grasp of the development of the new economy and int the greater bay area youth employment scheme launched earlier this year also provides about 700 int places to encourage enterprises to employ hong kong's university graduates so that the latter can undertake int related work and receive on the job training in hong kong and another city in gba innovation and technology infrastructure over 80 percent of the areas in the two buildings under stage one of the science park expansion program has been occupied as for the data technology hub in the chunkwano industrial estate since its commencement of operation in the fourth quarter of last year taxi enterprises have already set up offices there or signed tenancy agreements besides a number of enterprises have expressed interest in setting up offices in the hub the inner cell adjacent to the science park was completed at the end of last year providing about 500 residential spaces with flexible design facilities such as shared workspaces for the research personnel in the science park leasing activities will commence and a trial run will be held in the first half of this year the supply of r d and working spaces in the hong kong science park and cyberport falls short of demand in the last two budgets resources were set aside for the science park expansion and cyberport 5 development which will respectively provide 20,000 and 63,000 square meters of floor area mainly for r d or operation of int enterprises we are also pressing ahead with the development of the hong kong shenzhen innovation and technology park in the Lok Ma chao loop a provision of about 32.5 billion has been approved for the project works have already commenced 
the first batch of facilities is expected to be completed in phases from 2024 to 2027. The economic contribution to Hong Kong of which is expected to reach 5.5 billion per annum with about 4,800 jobs to be created. Upon full development, the park will be the largest ever INT platform in Hong Kong, providing a gross floor area of 1.2 million square meters, which is approximately three times that of the science park. Its economic contribution to Hong Kong is, is expected to reach $55 billion per annum, with about 52,000 jobs to be created. On digital infrastructure, the coverage of 5G network in Hong Kong is now over 90%. The subsidy scheme for expanding fiber-based network to villages in remote areas will be completed in phases from this year. The government will continue to support the development of 5G networks and applications, release more 5G spectrum in different frequency bands, facilitate the setting up of radio base stations by operators at suitable government venues and public facilities, assist in the relocation of the Typo satellite earth stations and provide land at Chung Ham Kok Tally Port for the development of infrastructure to connect with external telecom facilities. Promote research and development. Over the past few years, we have been dedicated to promoting R&D, but it takes time to deliver results. These efforts are gradually bearing fruit with a rising GDP on R&D activities in recent years, boosting our confidence in promoting R&D. Amendments were made to the Inland Revenue Ordinance in late 2018 to provide for enhanced tax deduction reduction for qualifying R&D expenditure to encourage enterprises to devote resources to local R&D. The total amount of R&D expenditure for which claims of tax deduction were made in the first year of assessment has more than doubled since the implementation of this measure. 70% of this amount enjoyed enhanced tax deduction. The measure has delivered notable results. Since permission was granted for the remittance of mainland R&D funding to Hong Kong, the State Ministry of Science and Technology, Guangdong Provincial Government and Shenzhen Municipal Government in the past two years have approved over renminbi 340 million for universities and research institutes in Hong Kong to conduct R&D or set up laboratories, adding impetus for local R&D activities. The Inno Hong Kong Research Clusters is our flagship project it comprises health at Inno Hong Kong on healthcare technologies and air at Inno Hong Kong on artificial intelligence and robotics technologies and has attracted many top notch universities and research institutions in the world. The first batch of about 20 R&D labs will commence operation progressively in the first quarter of the year. This will further consolidate Hong Kong's position as a global research collaboration hub. Funding under the Innovation and Technology Fund increased by over seven times in the last seven years. I will inject $4.75 billion per year to the ITF two years in a row to sustain its 17 funding schemes as well as the work of over 50 R&D labs in the next three years. Startups Hong Kong's startup ecosystem has become increasingly vibrant with an increase in the number of startups from about 1.1 thousand in 2014 to over 3.3 thousand last year. Investment from venture capital funds in Hong Kong also increased from 1.24 billion in 2014 to 9.9 .9 billion in 2019, representing an increase of over seven times. Over the past three years, INT enterprises in the Science Park and Cyberport have attracted over $41 billion of investment Besides, some 600 startups are being incubated by the Science Park and Cyberport on top of the nearly 1.3 thousand startups already graduated from the programs. The Innovation and Technology Venture Fund has invested more than 100 million in 19 local startups over the past two years, attracting more than $500 million of private investment. The ITVF appointed three new co-investment partners late last year we will continue to partner with venture capital funds to invest in local startups. In the past three years, the Hong Kong Science and Technology Parks Corporation has invested over 100 million in 13 technology enterprises through its corporate venture fund, attracting about $1.35 billion of private investment. The Cyberport Macro Fund set up by Cyberport also invested more than 120 million in 16 companies attracting over $860 million of private investment. The HA, SCPC and Cyberport will inject $350 million and $200 million 
into the two funds respectively and extend their scope to cover Series B and later stage investments. The technology startup support scheme for universities has provided funding for of about $120 million to 139 startups in the past three years. Among those startups which have benefited from the scheme since inception, over half of them have launched their products in the market, more than 40% have earned revenue and about 60% have received capital injection from investors with a total amount of some $530 million, financial technology. The epidemic has sped up digital transformation of the Hong Kong financial market. On top of many fintech startups, there are eight virtual banks, four virtual insurers, and a virtual asset trading platform having been authorized to operate in Hong Kong. With a view to fostering the development of more novel financial products, the HSTPC and Cyberport will collaborate with the HAMA to attract more financial technology or research institutes to set up laboratories in Hong Kong with a focus on such areas as regulatory technology and cybersecurity where Hong Kong enjoys clearest advantages. In addition to the FinTech proof of concept subsidy scheme announced in January, the Hong Kong MA is considering enhancing its FinTech supervisory sandbox by providing through trained vetting and funding arrangements for those promising fintech solutions to reduce the time for the launch of innovative financial products in the market. Foster reindustrialization. Re the reindustrialization funding scheme, which was launched in July last year, provides subsidies on a matching basis to manufacturers for setting up new smart production lines in Hong Kong. The scheme has received 12 applications so far. The Advanced Manufacturing Center in the Changkwano Industrial Estate and the Microelectronics Center in the Yunlong Industrial Estate being developed by the HASTPC will be completed in the coming years. The two centers will provide a total gross floor area of over 140,000 square meters for smart production and high-end manufacturing industries. Quite a number of enterprises have expressed interest in setting up establishment in the two centers air cargo sector. The Hong Kong International Airport is a double gateway connecting the world and the GBA. With further growth in external trade in the GBA, particularly the booming of e-commerce and the personalization of consumer demand, orders received by manufacturers are becoming small in amount with a narrow delivery window. It can be envisaged that there will be an increasingly keen regional demand for air cargo services. Last year, HAIA handled 4.5 million tons of cargoes and airmail down by only 7% from the pre-epidemic level. The airport authority has active plans for developing intermodal cargo handling facilities so that there will be seamless transportation of mainland exports to the rest of the world through the HAIA and vice versa. With the expansion of the existing express air cargo terminal and the commissioning of a new premium logistics center as well as the three runway system, in Hong Kong International Airport's Annual cargo handling capacity is expected to increase from 7.4 million tons to some 9 million tons in 2024. When the airside intermodal cargo handling facility becomes operational as well, Hong Kong's position as the air cargo center of the GBA will be further reinforced. HAIA's capability in handling high value temperature controlled air cargo is internationally recognized. In addition, the government will work with the AA to actively explore measures to facilitate transshipment through Hong Kong with a view to maintaining our competitive edge as an international air cargo hub. We are confident that the HAIA will become the busiest cargo airport in the world again when the epidemic is over. We will submit a funding application to the LegCo within this year to redevelop the air mail center at the HAIA with a view to bringing the center into operation by the end of 2027 at the earliest. We will continue to work with the AA and other postal authorities on maximizing the use of the center's transit handling capacity to support the long-term development of the postal industry in the GBA. Cultural and creative industries. I will inject an additional $1 billion into the Create Smart Initiative in 2021 to 22 to continuously drive the development of the creative industries. The government has continued to allocate more resources to the development of arts and culture in recent years. In 2021 to 22, the total expenditure will exceed $5.7 billion. The West Kowloon Cultural District, WKCD, is a new landmark and attraction in Hong Kong. 
with the opening of M Plus and the Hong Kong Palace Museum in WKCD in this and next year, respectively, and the expected completion of the Lyric Center, Lyric Theater Complex in 2024, diversified development opportunities will be brought to the local arts and cultural sector. We plan to seek funding approval in the current legislative section session for taking forward the renovation of Chun Wan Public Library, the facility upgrading of Taipo Civic Center, as well as the renovation and improvements of Sai Wan Ho Civic Center. The above works cost a total of about $900 million, creating a total of some 210 employment opportunities. The government provided multiple rounds of assistance amounting to over $200 million to the arts and culture sector under the AEF, benefiting over 930 arts groups and over 6,800 arts practitioners. As many arts and culture activities were not able to, to stage, the industry has made use of technology to perform through various means, promoting the integration of arts and INT as a new trend of development. The Home Affairs Bureau has established an interbureau task force with $100 million reserved to promote the integration of arts and technology and support arts groups and INT savvy. Infrastructure Investments and Construction Industry The government will continue to invest in infrastructure. The annual capital works expenditure will exceed $100 billion in coming years. The annual total construction output will increase to around, around $300 billion, creating over 300,000 employment opportunities. The government and the construction Industry Council have been providing professional and comprehensive training programs for construction workers. The Hong Kong Institute of Construction also has a well-established training system offering a clear career progression path for its trainees. Measures to enhance training for skilled workers, subsidize the operation of SME contractors and registered subcontractors, and offer allowances to registered construction workers who are underemployed or temporarily unemployed for attending training courses have been implemented since January this year. The Development Bureau, DEVB, established the Center of Excellence for Major Project Leaders, which is the first institution in Asia specializing in nurturing leaders for works projects. To enhance the professional skills of mid-tier managers in the government and uplifts the project's delivery capability, I've earmarked $6 million for provision of systema systematic training to them in the next three years with a view to ensuring more effective use of public resources. Cost management is an important part of the sustainable development of the construction industry. The project strategy and governance office of the DEVB, apart from implementing, implementing strategic measures to raise cost effectiveness within the government, will also promote cost management culture to the industry. The government actively promotes the modular integrated construction method. Intake for the first batch of pilot projects, including the inner cell of the Hong Kong Science Park and the disciplined service services quarters for the fire services department at Park Shin Kok, is expected to commence early this year. Up to now, the Construction Innovation and Technology Fund has granted over $75 million to the industry for supporting the adoption of this method, and the buildings department has approved 31 pre-accepted MIC systems to facilitate their adoption by the private building developers. With $100 million allocated for the development of the integrated digital platform in the last budget, the platform will be implemented in phases from this year onwards for driving digitalization of public works through data integration and analysis to monitor projects' performance continuously and enhance the management of capital works projects. Building a livable city, land supply. The 2021 to 22 land sale program comprises a total of 15 residential sites and three commercial sites, capable of providing about 6,000 residential units and about 480,000 square meters of commercial floor area, respectively. With the residential sites under the land sale program, together with railway property development projects, private developments and redevelopment projects, and the urban renewal authorities projects, the potential land supply for the whole year is expected to have a capacity of providing about 16,500 units. The Secretary for Developments will later announce the details of the land sale program for the next financial year. The construction of Kutong North Fanlang North New Development Areas, NDAs, is making good progress. The intake for the first batch of public housing in Kutong North is expected to take place in 2021, one year earlier than originally planned. Private residential sites in the area will be tendered gradually. The 12 hectares of private land involved in the first phase of the works for Hong Shui Kiu, Ha Chun, and DA has been resumed as scheduled. Site formation and infrastructure works are underway. 
As for the Yunlong South developments, we are going through the statutory planning process. The first batch of public housing units will be completed in 2028. We will seek funding approval from the Electrical for studies related to the new territories north NDA within this legislative session. The studies will commence shortly afterwards. The first two parcels of housing land under the Chongshong East Reclamation Works were handed over to the Hong Kong Housing Authority for public housing development last year. The first intake for about 10,000 public housing units will take place in 2024. We estimate that in the NDA project and other government and private development projects under planning, there is a total of over 860 hectares of brownfield sites in the new territory, which can gradually be redeveloped for housing and other land uses. Over the past few years, we have identified 210 sites with potential for housing development. Rezoning has been completed for or commenced for 70% of them. It is estimated that about 40 percent of the public housing units to be completed in the next 10 years will come from the rezoning sites. We are examining the feasibility of rezoning five commercial sites in Kowloon East for residential use, taking into account the latest economic situation and market response. If confirmed feasible, we plan to initiate the relevant statutory town planning procedure this year. A total of about 5,800 private housing units can be provided according to our preliminary estimation. The Mass Transit Railway Corporation Limited and government departments are pressing ahead with the development of the Xiu Hou Wan depot site. Our target is to have the first batch of about 6,000 public and private housing units gradually ready for intake in around 2030. Upon completion of the whole project, about 20,000 units will be provided, about half of which will be public housing units. We plan to conduct later this year district consultations on two single-site multiple-use projects, namely the redevelopment of Toon Moon Clinic and the joint use building for community facilities at Shan Mei Street in Sha Tin. Besides, we will apply funding from the Electrical as soon as possible for three other projects, namely one at the former Anderson Road Quarry site, one in Cheng Quan Old Town Centre, and the other one near Sheng Wan Fire Station. In addition, we are reviewing about 40 government institution or community sites with joint use potential. We hope to put forward concrete proposals for these sites this year, including developing multipurpose public facility buildings. The DEVB has set up the Development, development Projects Facilitation Office to facilitate the processing of planning, lease modification, and building plan applications, etc., for private residential development projects with a yield of 500 flags or more by enhancing coordination among the departments involved. The DVB and the Lands Department will introduce a policy scheme for charging land premium at standard rates in this quarter to encourage redevelopment of industrial buildings. Housing supply. We have identified land for the provision of 316,000 public housing units in the coming 10 years. If the redevelopment of the Hong Kong Housing Authority's factory at state the number of public housing units may see further increase. It is estimated that the total public housing production in the five-year period from 2020 to 21 is about 101,400 units, comprising over 70,000 public rental housing and green form subsidized home ownership scheme units, and over 30,000 other subsidized sales units. On private housing, it is estimated that the completion of private Residential units will average over 18,000 units annually in the five years from 2021, representing an increase of about 5% over the annual average of the past five years. The government has already identified land for the provision of about 14,000 transitional housing units by the end of 2023. Intake of residents for over 1,100 units has taken place. Projects involving about 9,800 units have been launched. The $5 billion funding scheme to support transitional housing projects has approved projects involving over $2.6 billion. The government will inject another $3.3 billion this year. The government is also seeking funding from the Community Care Fund to subsidize NGOs as a pilot scheme to rent suitable rooms in hotels and guest houses with relatively low occupancy rates for use as transitional housing. Green City. The government strives to achieve carbon neutrality before 2050 and will update the Hong Kong's climate action plan in the middle of this year to set out more proactive strategies and measures to reduce carbon emissions. We are setting an example by implementing the green energy targets to boost the overall energy performance of the government by 6% by 2024 to 2025. Concurrently, the government will continue to promote new energy transportation so as to further reduce roadside air pollution. 
The government has all along been promoting the replacement of conventional fuel-propelled private cars (PCs) with electric vehicles (EVs). Last year, one out of eight new PCs is EV. In the past 10 years, the number of EVs increased from 184 to over 18,500, with the total number of electric private cars (EPCs) accounting for 2.7 percent of the total number of PCs in Hong Kong. The one-for-one -one replacement scheme provides a higher first registration tax concession for owners who buy a new EPC and scrap their eligible old PC subject to a cap of $250,000. Since its launch, 90 percent of the owners of first registered EPCs have benefited from this scheme. The first registration tax concession for general EPCs is $97,500. The government launched the $2 billion EV charging at home subsidy scheme in October last year. It is expected that about 60,000 parking spaces in existing private residential buildings will be provided with EV charging enabling infrastructure under this scheme in three years. Since the introduction of this scheme, applications involving more than 50,000 parking spaces have been received. Last year, the government allocated an additional funding of $800 million to the new Energy Transport Fund and expanded its funding scope to cover additional types of electric commercial vehicles. As at the end of last year, the amount of subsidy granted under the fund was $154 million, covering nearly 200 projects on electric and hybrid commercial vehicles as well as conventional buses and ferries. Moreover, the government earmarked $80 million for Green Public Light Bus PLB operators to embark on a pilot scheme on electric PLBs from 2023. Meanwhile, the government has also earmarked $350 million to provide subsidies for ferry operators to conduct trials on electric ferries serving in-harbour routes of the Victoria Harbour from 2023. The Environment, the Environment Bureau will announce next month Hong Kong's first roadmap on the popularization of EVs, setting out long-term policy objectives and plans on the use of EVs and their associated supporting facilities. The key measures include seizing the new registration of fuel-propelled PCs in 2035 or earlier, expanding the EV charging network and promoting its marketization, training of EV technical and maintenance practitioners, and formulating a producer responsibility scheme for retired EV batteries. The government will also take the lead to use more EVs. Improve air quality. To further improve air quality, the government has implemented an excrucia payment scheme of $7.1 billion to phase out about 40,000 Euro for diesel commercial vehicles by the end of 2027. The government will finish updating the Clean Air Plan for Hong Kong by the middle of this year to set out long term goals and device measures to further improve air quality. Relieve traffic congestion. The number of PCs has been on the rise. Traffic congestion has been aggravating. The FRT and the vehicle license fee for PCs have not been adjusted since 2011 and 1991, respectively. I propose increasing the rates of each tax band for the FRT for PCs, including EPCs, by 15% and the vehicle license fee by 30%. The above-mentioned adjustments have been cassetted for taking effect today. Other types of vehicles are not affected. The maximum FRT concession for EPCs under the one-for-one -one replacement scheme will be raised correspondingly to $287,500, while FRT concession cap for general EPCs will remain unchanged. The Transport Department will also continue the studies on congestion charging and the electronic road pricing policy scheme in the central with the aim of optimizing the use of road space and relieving traffic congestion. The carbonize and reduce waste. In addition to the resources earmarked in previous budgets, I will set aside an extra $1 billion for more than 80 projects to install additional small-scale renewable energy systems at government buildings and infrastructure. I will also set aside $150 million to conduct energy audits and install energy-saving appliances free of charge for NGOs supplanted by the Social Welfare Department. In addition, the Green Tech Fund, set up with an allocation of $200 million by the government, has just closed the first round of applications. The result is expected to be announced in the middle of this year. All these measures can help Hong Kong advance towards its carbon neutrality targets and will also create jobs. 
The government will inject an additional funding of $1 billion to the recycling fund and extend the application period to 2027 so as to render continuous support to the trade, particularly the SMEs, in enhancing its operational capabilities and efficiency as well as coping with the latest needs of both the local and non-local markets. It is expected that more than 1,000 businesses will benefit from the measure. Quality leaving. Apart from large-scale infrastructure projects, I also care about developing a quality city for our citizens, including enhancing the facilities in our highly popular country parks, hiking trails, recreational facilities, and harbour fronts facilities. I will allocate more resources to the relevant projects. I will set aside $500 million to carry out enhancement works on facilities in some country parks, such as providing recreational elements like additional lookout points, treetop adventure, and glamping sites, improving toilet facilities and barbecue and picnic sites, and revitalizing some wartime relics by converting them into open museums so as to enrich visitors' experience and enjoyment at the countryside. The new facilities will adopt low carbon and green design that integrates with its natural surroundings. The needs of all age groups and people with or without physical disabilities will be catered for. The new facilities will be rolled out gradually in the coming two to three years for public enjoyment. Meanwhile, I have also earmarked $55 million for the Tourism Commission to work with the AFCD to take forward the second phase of the enhancement program for 10 popular hiking trails in country parks that have potential for tourism in the coming five years with a view to enriching leisure experience of the public and visitors. Upgrade recreational facilities. The government has launched a five-year plan to modify more than 170 public play spaces managed by the LCSD across the territory since 2019, with a view to providing children's play equipment with in which incorporates more elements of fun, creativity, and challenge. To cater for people's diverse needs for fitness equipment, the LCSD will install some noble outdoor fitness, fitness equipment as appropriate when constructing new parks or renovating existing ones, such as the Yetming Road Park in North District, which is near completion, and the Butterfly Beach Park in Toonwood. Football has long been one of the most popular sports. The Kai Duck Sports Park, scheduled for completion in 2023, will provide, among others, two main stadiums for hosting both international and local football matches. The five-year plan for sports and recreation, recreational facilities also includes the construction or reconstruction of 12 football pitches, including the redevelopment of Yunlong Stadium. I will earmark $318 million to implement a five-year plan for upgrading over 70 football pitches under the management of LCSD, including substantially increasing the number of 5A, 5A side football pitches meeting international standards, exploring the possibility of expanding the existing football pitches in the standard 11 aside turf pitches and ex expediting the replacement of artificial turf on football pitches. Relevant National Sports Association and their affiliates, district football groups, schools, and other organizations with more up to standard football pitches to organize football training programs and football matches in the future. The general public, in particular young people, will have more opportunities to play football regularly and develop their potential thereby contributing to the long-term developments of football in Hong Kong. Enhanced Harbour Fund. I have earlier earmarked a total of $6.5 billion for Harbour Fund's enhancement. We have completed six kilometres of Harbour Fund's promenades over the past three years or so for public enjoyment. The 20 kilometer plus Victoria Harbour Front promenades have now become popular leisure sports. This year, we will seek funding from the Legislative Council for commencing the construction works for of two major projects, namely the boardwalk underneath the Island Eastern Corridor and the Harbour Friends Park at Eastern Street North in Sai Ying Pun. An incremental approach will continue to be adopted so that the Harbour Friends sites can be opened as early as possible for public enjoyment. Strengthening healthcare system, healthcare facilities and manpower. The hospital authority will press ahead with the implementation of the first 10-year hospital development plan, HDP, and the planning of the second 10-year HDP. The HA will review the design of hospital projects under the two 10-year HDPs, taking into account the experience in combating COVID-19 and incorporates required provisions for two to three general wards in each selected hospital so that they can be readily converted into tier two isolation wards when the need arises. To strengthen professional health care training, around $1.9 billion has been allocated to the University of Hong Kong, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and the Hong Kong Polytechnic University in the past two financial years for carrying out short-term renovation works and facility enhancements, as well as studies and medium and long-term work, works projects to increase their teaching facilities. The government will continue to work with the universities to upgrade, the, upgrade and increase healthcare-related teaching facilities. 
healthcare workers play a pivotal role in our fight against the epidemic. The large budget earmark funding to support the HA in providing sufficient manpower for the public health care system and easing the pressure on health care workers. The measures are being taken forward. Primary health care. Following the commencement of service of the first district health center, the HC in Kwai Ching District, I earmark $650 million recurrence expenditure for setting up the HCs in six other districts last year. Two of them in Shamshibo and Wang Daixin targets to commence operation within the coming two years. Last year, I also allocated about $600 million for setting up DHC expresses in the remaining 11 districts, which are expected to commence service progressively within this year. Developments of Chinese medicine. The government will award the service deed for the Chinese medicine hospital in Changwano in the middle of this year and construction works are expected to be completed in 2025. Since last year, the government has also allocated more resources to the 18 Chinese medicine clinics come training and research centers, with a view to continuously enhancing the remuneration package of and training for Chinese medicine practitioners. Moreover, the government promotes the development of Chinese medicine in Hong Kong through a dedicated fund of $500 million. Mental health services. The government will provide additional recurrence funding of around $147 million to enhance child and adolescent psychiatric, community psychiatric, and psychogeriatric services of the HA and support the enhanced service of Kwai Chung Hospital upon its redevelopment. It was earlier announced that a sum of $300 million will be used for strengthening support for people in need in the community, as well as enhancing public awareness of the importance of mental health. Caring and inclusion. The government will provide an extra 1,500 subsidized elderly home care services places this year, involving an annual expenditure of about $150 million. The government is also taking forward 66 new projects, providing about 8,800 residential care places and about 2,800 subsidized daycare service places for the elderly in the coming few years. The government has substantially increased the resources allocated to rehabilitation services in recent years. The number of places for on-site preschool rehabilitation services has been increased by 1,000 to 8,000 in the current school year, and is, ex and is expected to further increase to 10,000 in 2022 to 23 school year. The Labor Department launched the Racial Diversity Employment Program last year to enable NGOs to provide one-stop employment services for ethnic minority job seekers through a case management approach. Over 500 ethnic minority job seekers are expected to participate in the first two years of the program. The revenue of, for the lotteries fund has dropped substantially due to the epidemic and will make an inject, injection of $1.1 billion to ensure that development projects in respect of much needed social welfare services premises, particularly major facilities for elderly and rehabilitation services, can be received as scheduled and that the feasibility studies and detailed design work for such projects will not be affected. Public finance. Deficits budget. As an open economy with a relatively narrow tax base, Hong Kong's government's revenue is susceptible to changes in the economic environment. The aging population also poses pressure on public expenditure. Though I have great confidence in Hong Kong's fundamental streams and long-term prospects, we must, in the face of an economic downturn and the aforesaid challenges, exercise extra prudence in managing public finance. Our fiscal reserves are the fruits of the economic development of Hong Kong and the hard work of our people over the years. They enable us to adopt a deficit budget amid the prevailing economic downturn and launch counter-cyclical measures to support the economy and relieve people's burden. In the past year, we have increased government expenditure substantially to combat the epidemic and roll out relief measures, which resulted in our fiscal reserves dropping sharply in two years from the equivalence of 23 months of government expenditure to 13 months. Although I forecast an improvement in revenue for the next financial year, I expect that the fiscal deficit will be $101.6 billion, accounting for 3.6% of our GDP due to the counter cyclical fiscal measures and the continued in increase in recurrent expenditure. In other words, Hong Kong will record a deficit for a number of years after achieving a surplus for 15 years. As shown in the medium range forecast MRF, the operating account is projected to be in deficit for five consecutive years. The operating deficit for 2021 to 22 will be more than $140 billion, mainly due to the counter cyclical measures while the operating deficits for the remaining four years will range from $22.4 billion to $40.7 billion. 
The consolidated accounts is also expected to record a deficit for four consecutive years. The above forecast has not yet taken into account any tax rebate or relief measure that the government may implement in the future. The deficits are mainly caused by the fact that the rise in government expenditure is outpacing the increase in government revenue, especially in terms of recurrent expenditure. Recurrent expenditure of the government increased from about $150 billion in 1997 to 98 to about $470 billion in 2020 to 21, representing a more than threefold increase. The significant rise in government expenditure in recent years is for enhancing services or investing for the future. However, as emphasized in my last budget, government expenditure should enter a consolidation period. The long-term financial commitments should also be commensurate with the increase in revenue. As a number of measures announced in this year's budget will have a bearing on the new financial year and the MRF, I would like to offer some explanations here to members and the public. To optimize the use of fiscal reserves for seeking a better ret return to meet future needs, the government set up the Future Fund in 2016 to make longer-term investments for a period of 10 years. The investment return of the fund forms an integral part of public financial resources and has accumulated a re return amounting to nearly $100 billion. While the government has all along been disclosing the rates of return of the Future Fund, the investment return yet to be brought back has not been reflected under the cash-based government accounts. Starting from 2021 to 22, I will reflect the cumulative investment return of the fund in operating accounts on a progressive basis, with $25 billion brought back in the first year. The 2021 to 22 budget has also included $23 billion brought back from the housing reserve and the annual proceeds of about $35 billion from the expansion of the government green bond program, as mentioned earlier. The sums raised under the government green bond program will provide funding for green projects under the Capital Works Reserve Fund, but will not be used to finance operating expenditure and hence will not undermine public finance discipline. The issuance of bonds cannot bolster our real financial strength as it ultimately requires the repayment of principal and interest. Nonetheless, the issuance of additional green bonds for financing eligible projects can definitely relieve the government's fiscal pressure arising from the need to use existing resources to meet capital expenditure. This is a reasonable and appropriate approach in the light of the current low interest rate environment and is also conducive to the development of Hong Kong's bond market. The above measures of bringing back the future fund's investment return and the housing reserve and issuing additional green bonds will ensure that our fiscal reserves can be maintained at a relatively robust level despite fiscal or deficit budgets in the next few years. They would enhance confidence in Hong Kong's fiscal strength and is conducive to maintaining our financial stability. However, in the long run, the key to maintaining healthy public finances is to follow the principle of keeping expansion within the limits of revenue and ensure that the growth of expansion is commensurate with economic growth. In the face of the challenges of fiscal deficits, we should not only reduce expansion but also increase revenue. Reduce expansion. This year's budget will continue to roll out a series of measures for supporting individuals and businesses. Last year, Hong Kong's economy was battered by the epidemic, and all sectors of the community were generally affected in varying degrees, particularly the grassroots. Despite the fiscal deficit, I've decided not to reduce our spending in areas relating to people's livelihood especially resources allocated to the three policy areas of education, social welfare, and health care in order to safeguard people's livelihood and maintain public confidence. In 2021-22, to the recurrent funding for these three policy areas amounts to $302.3 billion in total, accounting for 58% of the government's total estimated recurrent expansion and representing an increase of 45% over the provision of 2082 billion dollars in 2017 to 18. The government will set an example by cutting expenditure to strengthen fiscal discipline. In 2021 to 22, we will have zero growth in the civil service establishment. Besides, the government will implement an expansion reduction program by requiring all policy bureaus and departments to reduce expansion without affecting livelihood related spending. The goal is to trim recurrent expenditure by 1% in 2022 to 23. The estimated savings will be about 3.9 billion. While it seems not too difficult to achieve the 1% cut in recurrent expenditure, there is limited room for curbing expenses relating 
to personnel emoluments, which account for about 60% of recurrent expansion of government departments. We can only achieve the target mainly through savings from the remaining 40% of recurrent expansion, including major items such as general expenses and subventions. All departments have to undertake critical review, adjust priorities, and enhance efficiency in order to achieve the savings target without affecting day-to-day -day operation and public services they provide. Many a little makes a pickle. Increased revenue. As I have pointed out in my budget last year, my um, Hong Kong needs to maintain the development and vibrancy of our economy and identify new areas of growth with a view to increasing our revenue. I have just elaborated on the long-term positioning of Hong Kong's economy and the strategies for the development of our major sectors, which will help increase government revenue on the long run. Besides, I mentioned last year that we need to consider seeking new revenue sources or revising tax rates and reducing one-off relief measures progressively. Though raising tax rates can increase revenue on the short run, the choice must be made carefully. Having duly considered the impacts on the securities market and our international competitiveness, we have decided to introduce a bill to raise the rate of stamp duty on stock transfers from the current 0.1% to 0.13% of the consideration or value of each transaction payable by buyers and sellers respectively. The government will continue to spare no effort in introducing measures to facilitate the development of the securities market to take our financial services sector to the next level. As businesses and individuals are generally under considerable financial pressure amid the prevailing economic environment and the epidemic, I consider that it is not the appropriate time to revise the rates of profit tax and salaries tax, which are our major sources of revenue. Nevertheless, we will keep in view the situation and make adjustments at the appropriate time. During budget consultations, I received many proposals to introduce new taxes. If we do so, we have to carefully examine the proposals, take all factors into account, and earnestly listen to views of various sectors. Fighting the epidemic and reviving the economy are our current priorities. This is not the time to introduce new taxes. Nevertheless, we will carry out related research and make preparation to facilitate in-depth discussions at a suitable time and forge consensus before we introduce new taxes to increase revenue. International Tax Cooperation The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development is drawing up new proposals to address base erosion and profit shifting, or BEPS 2.0, which include the introduction of a global minimum tax rate and a digital tax. In mid-2020, the advisory panel on BEPS 2.0 commenced work on assessing the impact of the proposals on Hong Kong. Meanwhile, the government has been collecting views from stakeholders in the business sector. Taking into account the preliminary views of the advisory panel, I would like to outline the direction of the government's response measures so that the business sector can have a better grasp of the issue and make early preparation. First, as an international financial and business center, Hong Kong will actively implement the BEPS 2.0 proposals according to international consensus. Second, as most of the rules under BEPS 2.0 are only applicable to large multinational corporations, we will minimize the impacts on local SMEs where possible when drawing up the response measures and strive to maintain the simplicity, certainty, and fairness of our tax regime, which are our key advantages. Third, while safeguarding Hong Kong's taxing rights, we will at the same time minimize the compliance burden on affected corporations. Fourth, we will keep up our efforts in improving Hong Kong's business environment and enhancing our competitiveness to attract multinational corporations to invest and operate in Hong Kong. Once the OECD has finalized the proposal, the advisory panel will put forward its recommendations on the specific response measures in its report to me. Rating system. The rating system in Hong Kong has not undergone any major change since 1995. To ensure that our rating system could keep pace with the times, I have requested the FSTB and the Rating and Evaluation Department to review whether there is any room for improvement in respect of the rating system. We will review the case for introducing a progressive element to the rating system and that for providing rates concession to owner-occupied properties on a regular basis. Furthermore, we will consider shifting the primary liability for rates payment from the occupier to the owner of a property to reflect that the ultimate responsibility with regard to a property should rest with its owner. The government will consult the relevant legal panel on whether and how to revise the rating system.
revised estimates for 2020 to 21. The 2020 to 21 revised estimates on government revenue is 543.5 billion, lower than the original estimate by 5.1 percent or 29 billion. This is mainly due to the lower than expected revenue from land premium. Revenue from land premium is 87 billion, substantially lower than the original estimate by 31 billion, mainly due to the deferment of the disposal timetable of a high value commercial site in the year. Revenue from profits tax is 131 billion, comparable to the original estimate. Meanwhile, revenue from salaries tax is 72 billion, which is 12.1 billion higher than the original estimate. This is mainly because some tax revenue that should be received in previous year could only be collected this year as a result of the deferred tax assessment cycle. Stamp duty revenue is 79 billion, which is 4 billion higher than the original estimate. This is mainly due to the hectic trading in the stock market. As for government expenditure, the revised estimate is 820.4 billion, 12.2% or 89.3 billion higher than the original estimate. This is mainly because of the need to make injections into the AEF and meet expenditure on other helping measures. At the same time, expenditure on public works project was 7.1 billion lower than the original estimate. All in all, I forecast a deficit of 257.6 billion for 2020 to 21. Fiscal reserves are expected to be 902.7 billion by the 31st of March 2021. The civil service establishment increased by 6,082 posts in this financial year, representing a growth of 3.2%. The increase in the establishment is mainly due to the implementation of new policies and measures by the government and the need to cope with additional workload. Estimates for 2021 to 22. The major policy initiatives announced in the 2020 policy address involve an operating expenditure of about 18.3 billion and a capital expenditure of 2.1 billion. I will ensure that adequate resources are provided to fully support the launch of these initiatives. Total government revenue for 2021 to 22 is, is estimated to be 591.9 591.1 billion. Earnings and profit tax is estimated to be 200.7 billion, decreasing by 6.1% compared with the revised estimate for 2020 to 21. Having regard to the land sale program and the land supply target of the coming year, revenue from land premium is ex is estimated to be 97.6 billion, increasing by 12.1% compared with the revised estimate for 2020 to 21. Revenue from stamp duties is estimated to be 92 billion, increasing by 16.5% compared with the revised estimate for 2020 to 21. The current term government has launched a series of measures to improve people's livelihood. Recurrent expansion for 2020 to 21 increased by 70 by 7.6% compared with the last financial year, while total government expansion also increased by 35%. Recurrent expansion for the new financial year will further increase by 9.6%, demonstrating the government's determination to stimulate the economy and ease people's burden. Public expansion will account for about 25% of GDP on average during the five-year period up to 2025 to 26 in the MRF. In 2021 to 22, the estimated recurrent expansion on education, social welfare, and healthcare accounts for 58% of government ex recurrent expansion or 302 0.3 billion. Recurrent, recurrent expenditure in these three areas recorded a cumulative increase of 53% over the past five years. Our target is to have zero growth in the civil service establishment in 2021 to 22. The Civil Service Bureau has encouraged departments to, encourage, to enhance effectiveness through reprioritization, internal redeployment, and streamlining of work processes to cope with the workload. Medium range forecast. The MLF projects mainly from a macro perspective the revenue and expenditure as well as financial position of the government. From 2022 to 23 to 2025 to 24, a real economic growth rate of 3.3% is adopted for the MRF. During the above period, the average annual capital works expansion will exceed $100 billion, while the growth of recurrent government expansion ranges from 3.5% and 4.7% and per annum. Regarding revenue from land premium, the forecast from 2022 to 23 onwards is based on the average proportion of revenue from land premium to GDP over the past 15 years, which is 3.6% of GDP. I also assume that the growth rate of revenue from profit tax and other taxes will correspond to the economic growth rate in the next few years. In addition, the MRF reflects the bringing back of the housing reserve and the investment return of the future fund and the proceeds of the government green bond program.
Based on the above assumptions and arrangements, I forecast an annual deficit in the operating account in each of the coming five financial years, as well as a, a deficit in the capital account from 2022 to 23 to 2024 to 25. The estimated deficit in the operating account in 2021 to 22 is mainly due to the expenditure arising from the one-off relief measures announced in this budget and some of the relief measures annou announced last year. The forecast deficit in the operating account in the following four years is attributed to the fact that recurrent expenditure will be higher than revenue receipts. The above forecast has not taken into account any tax rebate or relief measure that the government may implement over these four years. Fiscal reserves are estimated at $775.8 billion by the end of March 2026, representing 22% of GDP, or equivalent to 12 months of government expenditure. Mr. President, members, over the past two years, Hong Kong has suffered successive setbacks, and now we have to fight the epidemic and ride out the economic difficulties. Life has not been easy for us all. I often chat with people, especially during the preparation for the budget. I know how difficult it is to earn a living during the economic downturn. I can feel their pain. This is why, despite a record high def fiscal deficit in 2020 to 21, I once again propose a budget involving a deficit of over $100 billion. I do so after careful consideration as the counter-cyclical measures are necessary for stabilizing the economy and alleviating people's burden. At the same time, I'm mindful of the need to expand government revenue and create fiscal space in a prudent manner. In spite of the pressure we now face, looking back, we have walked all the way through thick and thin. However harsh life might have been, Hong Kong remains the home that we treasure. Home is not where we find perfection. It is where we stay together as a family, sharing mutual care, acceptance, and support. This unprecedented pandemic reminds us that we are all in the same boat. Deep-seated conflicts cannot be resolved instantly, nor can wounds be healed overnight. Given time, even the tightest knot can be untied. The economy may move in a cycle, but there is always a way to prosperity. We have overcome many challenges and always come out stronger. Let us be steadfast and ride out the storm. Together, we will build a better Hong Kong. Thank you, President. Thank you. I now propose the question to you that the above-mentioned bill be read the second time. In accordance with the rules of procedure, the second reading debate is adjourned and the estimates are referred to the Finance Committee for examination before the debate on the bill resumes. Secretary for Justice. Chief Jack. President, I move that the arbitration amendment bill 2021, that is the bill, be read a second time. The main object of the bill is to amend the arbitration ordinance CAP 609 to fully implement the supplemental arrangement concerning mutual enforcement of arbitral awards between the mainland and the Hong Kong SAR. That is the supplemental arrangement signed between the government of Hong Kong SAR and the Supreme People's Court of the PR People's Republic of China on the 27th of November 2020. The purpose of signing the supplemental arrangement is to amend the arrangements concerning mutual enforcement of arbitral awards between the mainland and the Hong Kong SAR, that is the arrangement, which came into effect on the 1st of February 2000, 2000. This will bring the arrangements more fully in line with the current practice of international arbitration. In doing so, reference has been made to the implementation experience accrued over the years and the, co and the comments from the arbitration sector. 
The amendments contained in these supplemental arrangements were made in alignment with the spirit of the New York Convention and do not constitute any major change of policy. The supplemental arrangements amend the arrangements in certain aspects, for example, redefining the scope of arbitral awards with the seats of arbitration and removing the previous restriction of the arrangement, thus allowing parties to make simultaneous applications to both the courts of the mainland and the Hong Kong SAR for enforcement of an arbitral award. This is in line with the current practice of inter international arbitration under the New York Convention. To implement the above amendments, it is necessary to amend the arbitration ordinance. Following the completion of the relevant internal procedures in the mainland, the 